We'll begin in verse 1 here this morning. I hear pages turning yet, so I'll give you just a few moments. Okay. All righty. The Word of God says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give unto them, even to the children of Israel. Listen to the promise now in verse 3. For every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and the land of the Hittites, unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. And there shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. So be strong. Be of good courage. For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give unto them. Hallelujah. Glory. There's a land that God has for you. There's a land that God has for every child of God, every born-again saint. There is a place, there is a blessing, there is a divine providence, a divine will. There is a course of direction, there is a course and a place of blessing For you, the believer, no matter who you are in the body of Christ. Amen? There's a place for you. There's a blessing waiting for you. There's a land of grace. A land of providence and provision. There's a land of blessing. There's a land of peace and joy and prosperity. There's a place for you, the body of Christ. But my friend... Before we fully embrace it, before we fully receive it, there's one little obstacle in the way, and it's called the Jordan River. This morning's message, we're going to call it simply this, Crossing Jordan. Crossing Jordan. Have you crossed the river? Have you crossed the river to go into the land that God has promised you? Folks, I understand in the Old Testament, God gave them lands and properties. In the New Covenant, God gave us a cross, the finished work of the Son of God on your behalf. The promises of the New Covenant are much greater than that of what we read about here today. Yes, in the blessing of the Lord in the New Covenant, there is still natural, physical, financial blessings. But they go so much beyond a little piece of land in a place called Israel. There is a land of grace and mercy for you. A place where you can flourish like the palm tree. There is a land of what we call the life of God, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that belongs to you because your Savior won it all for you. Amen? Glory to God. But if you want everything for which Christ died for you, you got to get across the river. You must get across Jordan. And that is our message this morning, crossing Jordan. It's been 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. That journey was only meant to be about a year or two, actually, if they would have left Egypt land and went directly to the land of promise. It's only an 11-day journey. That journey, though, because of the work that God had to do in His people, weaning them from dependency on Egypt, the world system, and transferring them, weaning them from trust in self, trust in the flesh pots of Egypt, trust in uh, life as a slave, if we could call it that. They had to learn the way of faith. They had to learn how to trust the Lord. Amen. 
It took them 40 years to get across that land that should have only physically taken 11 days. But if we would give it a picture story and spiritualize it a little bit, you'll see your own walk of faith in the children of Israel. One thing we notice with the Israelites, they struggled trusting the Lord. Even by the great miracles of God, by splitting the Red Sea, they offered up the Paschal Lamb. God said, eat it in haste, have your staff in your hands, have everything packed up, you're going out of here tonight. They saw one of the greatest miracles that this world ever witnessed with their natural eye, the splitting of the Red Sea, and God bringing three million Israelites along with the strangers and those that were with them. They got through that sea, and man, they rejoiced on the other side. Hallelujah. Oh, things are going good. This is revival the way it should be in their mind. Amen? They saw the power of God. They saw the providence of God. They saw how God would come in and take care of them and deliver them from Pharaoh's armies who were pursuing them to destroy them and enslave them back into Egyptian slavery and bondage. And so as they're delivered and God begins to deal with them now, you would think by the great display of power, the great display of divine providence and, and the anointing of God and how, how God caused an east wind to come and blow all that night and parted that sea. You would think those people could trust God for anything. But as we read the story and you read the history through the book of Exodus, the book of Numbers, the book of Deuteronomy, we see that God's people struggled learning to trust God by faith. Amen? You'll find that in your own life. God can come through. God will answer prayer. God will provide a miracle. It'll encourage you. It'll build your faith up to a point. But three days later, you'll be just like the Israelites. I have been there a hundred times. All of a sudden, another problem comes. Another circumstance arises. Something happens. And we struggle trusting. You see, the way of faith, without faith, we cannot please the Lord. God wants you and I to trust Him. He wants faith out of you. We sang the song, He wants holiness, He wants righteousness, He wants brokenness, He wants all these things. But what God really wants from you is faith. He wants you to believe Him. He wants you to know that He is a God that through His Son, Jesus Christ, makes everything possible to you. If you can but believe. Amen. And so as we read the story over and over and over and over and over again, God shows up, does great things. He's leading his people. He's feeding them. He's giving them water. He's taking care of everything. Their shoes are not wearing out. Their clothes are not getting dirty. And they're going through a wilderness, a desert experience. But the desert is not the promised land. God made it clear to them, we're going to a land that flows with milk and honey. What we have to go through from, from the Red Sea to get to the brink of the Jordan River, it's only temporary because God has to suffer their manners. God has to teach them to trust Him by faith because only by faith can you inherit the promises. Amen. And God wants faith out of us. Without it, we can't please the Lord. Faith, but not a generic faith. Not a faith that, oh, I'm going to start a business, so I got faith that I can get this business going. Not that kind of faith. It's a faith in the divine providence of the Almighty. It's a faith that says, I trust God. It's a faith that says, I look to His Son, Jesus Christ, and His work on the cross for me every single day of my life. I look to Him. I look to His shed blood. I take up my cross. I bear His name in my heart. I walk with Him. I talk with Him. We walk hand in hand. I'm in fellowship with Him. My sin is under the blood. And I'm washed clean and I have the righteousness of God given to me in the person and work of Jesus Christ. See, I, I learned to walk in that. And that's the development of faith in your life. We, we don't learn this in a moment. You can't learn it in a textbook. You can't go to class. My, my son is in Bible school. 
And I'm going to tell you, he's probably in the best school on the planet as it regards teaching the Word of God. But I've watched him for this year and a half. He's learning good theology. He's learning many, many things about Scripture and the Word of God. But the greatest lessons he's weren't learning, and they tell you this when you become a student there, you will enter into a wilderness of life. And the greatest lessons you're going to learn is what God is teaching you about yourself and about life and about everything in your experiences outside of the Bible school. Amen? You see, folks, we got this mindset that everything can be learned in a, in, in, in a textbook. We can go learn the class. It's like becoming a car mechanic. Oh, I read the book. Okay, now go make it work now. It's on the job training. Spiritual life is on the job training. We come to church, we hear God's word. We hear God speak to us, encourage us, teach us theology, encourage us. But we don't learn it here. We learn of it here. But we learn it as we live our life Monday through Friday. Amen. The bumps and bruises of daily living. Living life in a fallen world. Living life where wicked people are. Learning and living and listening to God as he would teach us his way of faith. As I have to navigate through my day while I'm at work. While I'm tending to the needs of the house or my family. This is where we learn how to trust God. And see, like the Israelites, they kicked against the process. They didn't like the wilderness. God told Moses, as we're reading in our text, you know, the whole thing is get to the Jordan and let's get across the river into that land. Let's not live here. The wilderness was not their inheritance. The wilderness of life is not your inheritance. I find myself from time to time in somewhat of a wilderness as God is teaching me a new truth, as God is teaching me to depend on Him in areas that I have struggled depending on Him before. I don't like the testings. I don't like the trials that sometimes God has to allow to come my way. I've said it a thousand times, if you could pick your trials, it's never the one you're in. Amen? But He's having to teach me. He's having to teach me obedience and faith. And staying put, not running all the time. And not trying to thwart the process of God. But learning to be settled and strengthened and, and where God will anchor me into truth. And I, I come through this season, amen? And as I see the unbelief of my own heart and I have to daily take that to the Lord, I find my weakness in myself, but I find that anchor, that rock of my soul. I find that, that cross, that wooden beam by faith that I can cling to that says, my God will see me through. My God will make a way. My God will come through some way, somehow. Amen. Whereas maybe five years ago, I would have fell apart and kicked dust in the air and threw my little hissy fit because I just didn't like my circumstances. We've all been there. Some of you maybe are in that right now. It's okay. Five years from now, you won't be hissy fitting so much. A amen. You'll be trusting more. You'll be anchored in. And folks, this is a lifelong process. A amen. And it doesn't matter what you've been through. God's going to bring you out. There's still a land of promise. My God, listen. He got those people through that wilderness. Listen, listen to the word of God. This, God kept telling them there's a land for you. In Deuteronomy 1, Moses is speaking to the people of Israel. He said, The Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, Oh, you have dwelt long enough in this mountain, but turn you and take your journey and go into the mountain of the Amorites and the, all the places nigh thereunto, into the plain and into the hills and into the vale and into the south and by the seaside, unto the land of the Canaanites, unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. For behold, I have set the land before you. Now go in and possess the land, which the Lord swore unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. So God is always rehearsing with Israel 
that there's a land of promise he wants to get them to. That he had promised not just that current generation, but that he had promised to their forefathers. The promise has never changed. But they are now the current generation that is going to be the fulfillment of those promises. Amen? Hallelujah. And so they're told there's a land. I'm getting you to the land. I promise it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's coming. There's a land for you, Israel. And so, again, in Deuteronomy 8, the Word of God says, For the Lord thy God brings you into a good land. It is a good land. God said the promised land is a good land. It's a good land. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills. It's a land of wheat and of barley and of vines and of fig trees and of pomegranate. It's a land of olive oil and of honey. It's a land where thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. You shall not lack anything in it. It's a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you might dig brass. In other words, it's fertile, full of natural resources. And it's for them. Remember, he's talking to a people 3,500 years ago. He's saying, this land that I'm taking you to, that I have earmarked for you, Israel, it is the chief, the nicest, the, the, the best of all the lands of the earth. Amen. In Deuteronomy 11, he says this, the land where you go to possess it, it's not like the land of Egypt from where you came out, where you had to sow your seed and water it with your foot. He said, but the land where you go to possess it, it's a land of hills and of valleys. It drinks the water, the rain of heaven. It is a land which the Lord your God careth for. For the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it. From the beginning of the year, even unto the end of the year. Now, these are natural promises to the seed of Israel. But under the new covenant, your land is a land of grace, of mercy, a provision from the Lord. That when you're in His will, that if we get across that river into the promised land where God wants us to be, God will meet your need. He will take care of your financial need. He will take care of your physical need. He will take care of your emotional need. He will take care of your spiritual need. He'll heal your land. He'll bless you beyond anything you ever thought possible. Your future is in that land. Whether it be natural provision, whether it be sons and daughters, Whatever it be, it's all in that finished work of the cross of which the promised land is a picture story of. Hallelujah. You see, when you get across the river, that's the land of the spirit-filled life. That's the land of the true biblical abundant life. That's the land where the Holy Spirit of God is not only with you, but He's in you. And He's leading you. Hallelujah. And he's telling you of Christ. He's taking what God has given Jesus and given it to you. He's telling you when to turn left, when to turn right, when to stop, when to move. Amen. Folks, I'm here to say that promised land, that land of Canaan, I know our name is Promised Land Church. Maybe there's some parallel to it. But I'm not here to preach our church. I'm here to preach the promises of God to you. I'm here to say there is a land of blessing. There's a grace. There's a providence, a provision. All ratified by the blood of the Son of God. And paid for in full. Amen. But you only get it as you enter in to that spirit-filled end of it. You got to get across the river. You got to get across the river. Now, it's been 40 years and they're on the brink of the river and that was our text. God raises up Joshua. Moses, my servant is dead. Moses, a type of the law. We need law. We need law in the church and in our life. 
The law is the superstructure upon which grace flows. Paul said the law is good. But by mechanically trying to keep law, the law, we can't inherit the promises. Notice the fine line. There's a grace movement today that says we don't need law. Do as thou will. The grace of God covers all of everything we do. That's half truth. Grace will restore me. Grace will provide a place where I can ask God to forgive me. But grace, the true grace of God according to the Apostle Paul, teaches us to deny all worldliness and ungodliness. Amen? In other words, under grace... I have the ability to live right now. Amen. Under law, I couldn't live right. Under religion, under rules, under submitting myself under the mighty hand of man and obeying what they want you to obey, I would mess up all the time. I couldn't keep the rules. But when I found grace and truth through Jesus Christ, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah for His grace. I'm under grace. But grace is activated by faith. And the promises of God come on the platform of God's work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Hallelujah. Yeah, he says amen, brother. Amen. He's going to be a preacher someday. Hallelujah. Folks, you better understand, Jesus said if the people didn't praise God, the pews would, the rocks will, the carpet will. I'm telling you, the kids, the babies, I'm telling you. Amen. They're not making noise to be a nuisance. They're making noise because they're responding. Something's going on. Hallelujah. There's something going on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says it, through babes, God has perfected praise. Amen. Amen. You take some lessons, but we got to get across Jordan. We got to access that land of promise. We got to get to that which God has for us. Now, there were two and a half tribes. You'll read it in Joshua, the first chapter. I believe it was the Gadites, I believe the Reubenites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. We got up to the edge of the river, and if you ever see a river go through a desert, there's, 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 there's foliage, is that what I'm trying to say, on either side? Foliage on either side. Amen. And so we get the Israelites to the edge of the river, and God is saying, okay, it's time to cross. It's time to get into that land. But prior to all this going on, we had two and a half tribes tug at Moses, tug at his robe and say, listen, this land that we're in right now, we kind of like it. We don't really need to cross Jordan and get into where that other, the other land is. And so, in a way, it's an unbelief. But I see the picture story. They are all part of the mystical body of Christ. They're all Israelites. And God is so fair. God is so just. God does not force you or I or the body of Christ to do His will or even to desire His will. He puts it before us and He says, Come. Whosoever will, let him come. He doesn't take a stick and say, I'm driving you into that land of promise. I'm driving you into, that's why I got you this far. I spent 40 years getting you to the edge of this river, and you're all going in whether you like it or not. You know, I don't read that. And God isn't that way, but I don't know what got into those hearts of that two and a half tribe. And I'll be honest with you, in the modern body of Christ, I don't know what gets into people's hearts. Why some want more of the things of God, and some are just content with the parking lot. Come on. Come on. Two and a half tribes say, you know, we kind of like it here. We're parked right here. If I look around, there's water. We can, we can grow stuff. Our, our cattle are fine. Everything's okay. We don't need to cross that river. You see, I want to tell you something. We are a spirit-filled church. 
The new covenant is meant to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Pentecostal churches are spirit-filled churches. Why? Because Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It is biblical history. You can't slice and cut it up and tear out pages. It is there. It is truth. It is fact. To get across the Jordan is to cross over into the spirit-filled life. But there are two and a half tribes in the modern body of Christ, and I'm speaking worldwide, and I'm speaking figuratively, that want to stay in the parking lot and not go across and receive the better glories and graces and everything for which Christ died to give them. But they had a command. All right, I'll let you stay. But one thing you're going to do, you will cross over that river and help your brethren fight their battles. And whenever the land's been subdued, then you can go back across the river again and you can enjoy the parking lot. My words were intentionally chosen too. What is it about the spirit-filled life that the modern body of Christ is turning from? Why is it in the modern non-Pentecostal, non-spirit-filled church groups, they all want the parking lot. They all want the parking lot when they could have the best of the land, when they could have the fullness of that for which Christ died to give them. You see, I see a contrast there. There's a contrast between the non-spirit-filled and the spirit-filled. They are saved by the blood of Jesus. They do have a faith in God up to a point. But without the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, amen, then they're enjoying the parking lot. And God says, that's okay, I love you anyway. And I'll love them anyway. If that's all they want, that's all they are for hunger, that they don't want nothing beyond the parking lot, then that's fine. They're still part of the body of Christ but I'm going on with Jesus just the same. I want everything for which Christ died. I want to be full of the Holy Ghost. I want the power of God. I want to speak in tongues and worship God and pray in the Spirit. I want the life of God. I want the river of life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You see where this message is going? Now listen. Listen. We must all get across Jordan to access the land of promise. The New Testament has been penned by men as they were moved by the Holy Spirit to write. Thus, divine inspiration. The New Testament is the Word of God. Amen. It has been penned by Spirit-filled men and was written and penned from men that had the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Thus, the New Covenant, the New Testament has been written and penned from divine, spirit-filled perspective. Amen. 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 I preached that about eight, nine years ago. I got a guy all upset with me. He didn't like hearing that because he had just got done reading John MacArthur's book on how the, the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, that's all passed away and everybody that embraces that are, are devils. Amen? Oh. I'll tell you what, they're treading on dangerous ground. You know, you want to get on a crusade, why don't you fight sin and adultery and sin and shame and fornication and alcoholism and profanity. Why don't you deal with that kind of stuff? But don't touch the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, we've already identified children of Israel on the brink of the Jordan. they got to get across. If they don't get across Jordan, type of the spirit-filled life, the abundant life, the life where, where that land is watched over, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. That's the land God in his heart wanted to give them all along. But they got up to the edge and they parked there for a few days. 
and two and a half tribes already prearranged it with Moses. God said, fine, just give them what they want. And I call it the parking lot. You know, you'll never forget it. And those words were chosen carefully. Where are you today? Have you crossed that river? Are you in the land of promise or are you just enjoying the parking lot of Christianity? The parking lot is any church, any group that is non-spirit filled. It's, it's, it's just simple. They're saved. And, I'll, and I better qualify this. They are not substandard people in the kingdom of God. God loves them. They're, they're just as saved as I am, saved as you are. If their faith is in Jesus Christ. But folks, I still don't understand that mindset. I just don't. When you've tasted the greater glories, I want to tell you what's going on in the last 25 years of Christianity. The assemblies of God were at one time one of the greatest Pentecostal denominations. It was a movement. It was a move of God. Largely in part, you don't want to hear this, through Brother Swaggart's ministry in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You can cut it, slice it, you can throw dirt in the air. You can say, well, you're giving him credit. I'm not giving him credit. I'm giving him the Lord credit who called a man and who, a man who obeyed the call of God. I don't care if it's him or, or Pete Scuccelli. I don't care who he is. If God used the man and God used a person mightily, oh, he had problems. Well, you had problems too. Why doesn't that matter? You've had sin in your heart. You've done things you shouldn't have done. When the preacher does, yeah, I understand. I understand the preacher, oh, God calls him to a higher standard. Yeah, to stand behind the sacred desk, but first we're believers first. Amen. So God is permissible with your adultery, but not somebody else's. Oh, they smart for it. It's never right. It's always wrong, and they will smart for it. Amen. Lay that aside. But the whole thing with this AG movement... The assemblies of God were built on the Pentecostal promise of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And thousands upon thousands upon thousands went on to receive the mighty baptism in the Holy Spirit through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Amen. But when the voice went down in the early 90s, just like Moses now up in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, when the voice is gone, the children of Israel rose up and what was really in their heart, they started to rise up and play and dance to the song of the world. And they let all these queer things. You turn on the heresy channels that night on your direct TV, what's the result of that? The voice was gone for a while. And all the kooks came out. And then what happened is much of the church watched all the kooks and said, if that's Pentecostalism, I want nothing to do with it. And then half the preachers of the nation, when they realized the Spirit of God wasn't moving, they went to these so-called revivals, got anointed, came back and tried to make that happen in their church. And then we have people barking like dogs, slithering like snakes, screaming, screeching, making all sorts of weird jaded noises, and calling it a move of God in their church. And God is not nowhere to be found. Oh, there is a spirit at work, but it's not the Holy Spirit. How do you know it's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's holy. He's not weird. He's not strange. Oh, he may be strange if somebody's never seen him work before. My Bible says a true move of the Holy Spirit, a person that is non-spirit filled will feel convicted and give God glory because something's going on because the secrets of his heart are being revealed. Not leave and say, my God, I never, saw, I never knew this was Ronald McDonald's kooky farm. All right. We got to get across Jordan. But there's a cry today. I want to address something, and I hope I can do it circumspectly. And this is for this church. There's a cry from the Reb Shekas of today to pull the spirit-filled to the non-spirit-filled churches. 
You read it in 2 Kings chapter 18. Hezekiah was king over Judah. He was a righteous king. But the enemy come in, and Reb Shekha, who was the king's representative, told the people of Israel, we're going to come in and we're going to conquer. But I'm telling you, I'm calling you out before we destroy you. I'm calling any of you out to come unto... Let me read the scripture. I want you to see this. This is what Reb Shekha says today. Don't hearken to Hezekiah. For thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present or a bribe, and then come out to me. Then every one of you, each man, will eat of his own vine, and every one of his own fig tree. Every one of you will drink out of the waters of your own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like unto your own. Oh, it's a land of corn and of wine and of bread and of vineyards and of olive oil and of honey. Oh, that you may live and not die. Don't hearken to Hezekiah when he persuades you saying, Oh, God will deliver us. There have been some Reb Shekas that have been in this church. There have been some Reb Shekas that have been part of Promised Land Church the last 10 years. And when they move on, they don't come and talk to the pastor, but they'll pull at the people. And they'll tell you how great it is in a non-spirit-filled environment. They'll tell you how everything's going on there. They'll tell you how everything is happening, oh, in those non-spirit-filled churches. You be careful who you listen to. Because the Reb Sheka should be pulling you, if anything, if there's something so wrong with this work in ministry, then they should be pulling you to another spirit-filled work to get you across the river. Yes. Hallelujah. I'm going to say some strong things here. He said, I'm going to take you away. It's a land like under your own. All they're trying to do is get you back to the parking lot. If you've crossed Jordan, you have no business going back and setting up shop in the parking lot. Amen. Amen. You can sit in your car in that parking lot and enjoy church through live stream on your car radio. But why not just come across the street, get across the river, come in here and enjoy a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled, Word of God preaching service. Amen. Amen. You better watch out for the Reb Shekas people. And I'm not the type of pastor who's going to go chase everybody around. I know what we have. I know who put us here. I know who called us from heaven to be here. I know how God has providentially provided from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. God has always watched over Promised Land Church. Because we've always preached the truth. We've always preached Jesus Christ. And we've always preached the full gospel of Jesus. And that'll never stop. But the Reb Shekas are tugging at some of you. Hey, come over here. Come over here. Come over here. And all it's going to do is get you to a parking lot. Let me, let me I put this down last night. I thought, well, what, what is it? What can I expect from a non-spirit-filled church? Well, first of all, you'll never have a Pentecostal experience, ever. Flush it down the toilet, it'll never come. You go to a non-spirit-filled church, forget Pentecost, ever. Come on. Oh, well, God can break through. Well, you tell me one that He has. Tell me one church out there, non-spirit filled. Tell, tell me. Give, give me the list of them. You tell me how many have broke through to the Pentecostal experience. You may read about one in a book somewhere where it happened. Amen. What can I expect if I go to a church where they don't preach the Holy Spirit? Well, you're going to have a lot of teaching in that church, but little, if ever, any preaching. Teaching is important. They're still part of the body of Christ. I'll give them that. But you'll never see preaching like what you're seeing today. Amen. 
you'll see a lot of teaching, little if ever preaching. See, Paul said it this way, oh, they heap to themselves teachers, they got itchy ears. Let's get the next teaching. Oh, purpose-driven life, yeah, let's get that in there. Oh, government of 12, let's get that in there. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, uh, uh, family curses, oh, yeah, let's get that. Oh, okay, okay. A lot of teaching, little if ever any preaching. What, do I, what can I expect from a non-spirit-filled church? You're going to see a lot of people, a lot of religious activity. But can I remind you, many gather at Cain's altar, but very few at Abel's. You say, what does that mean, pastor? In the beginning, you had Abel and Cain. Abel did what God asked him. He offered up the first thing. He, he shed the blood of that little innocent lamb, which was a type of God's son, who would come 4,000 years later. Cain said, forget it, I'm not touching that. I don't want to get bloody. So I bring up, I, I worked hard and I, I bring my basket of fruit, man. God said, I can't accept that because it doesn't represent my son, Jesus Christ, who will give his life as a ransom for the world. Cain said, fool you on you. God said, just go to the door, get that. You'll be accepted, Cain. He said, no, I want the parking lot. Not even that per se, yeah. But they're preaching Jesus. Well, li listen to me here. What can I expect from a non-spirit-filled church? Okay, a lot of teaching, little of ever any preaching, a lot of people, a lot of religious activity, a heavy emphasis on community service. Amen? What's wrong with that, Pastor? I've had people here that have pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled. You need to do more. We have to have ice cream socials. we got to have more going on in the community. We should have something going on every day. But it's funny, the very people that pull at you and say that I'll tell you how burned out they got because the other church, they had all that activity. If it was so right, why ain't they there yet? Amen. I have enough trouble getting you here twice a week. <laughs> In a spirit-filled church. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So they have a heavy emphasis on community service. Nothing wrong with having some outreaches as long as they're spirit induced. God lays it on your heart to start something, some kind of an outreach. God lays it on your heart to begin some type of ministry. Then let the Holy Spirit deal with you. Lay it on your heart. And the same God who watches from the beginning of the year to the end will, will watch over your work and provide every need. They have a heavy emphasis on community service. But what about the Pentecostal? Our emphasis is on the preaching of the Word of God, prayer, the Holy Spirit, the benefits of the cross, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 What can I expect from a non-spirit-filled -spirit church? Limited, if any, moving of the Holy Spirit. You see, in the beginning, my Bible says that in the beginning, God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God moved. Right from the beginning of human history, the Spirit of God moved. And when God moved, things came to life. Yeah. Amen. Limited, if any. Oh, once in a while the preacher will say something and get a clap out of the people in the non-spirit-filled church. But can I remind you, even a broken clock is right twice a day. You're going to hit it once in a while. And as a spirit-filled Christian, I can go to a Lutheran funeral service, and when the brother reads a scripture, I can feel the Spirit of God at times. Because I'm spirit-filled, but everybody else sitting there like a wooden Indian, you know, they, they don't feel it. <laughs> right? Right? Amen. Amen. You see, there's benefits when you get across that river. Amen. I'm not in the parking lot. I'm in the land of promise. And I'm wanting everything for which Christ died to give me. Amen. What can I expect in a non-spirit-filled environment? You'll never see a baptism in the Holy Spirit. They say it's all passed away and it's not for today. They don't teach that. Then why don't they see people filled with the Holy Spirit? 
They don't see no baptisms in the Holy Spirit because they're telling it, they're, they're putting unbelief in people by saying it's all passed away, it was for another time frame, it was for a past era. And if you don't see no baptism in the Holy Spirit, there can be no functioning of the gifts of the Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is denied by willful ignorance. There's enough history. There's enough church history. There's enough physical evidence now in this last hundred or so years of God pouring out His Spirit since the early 1900s. Millions of believers have been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. There has been great healing revivals, great movements where people have seen the power of God, the miracle power of God. There are so many tongue talkers today, my God, you can't deny it. And to deny it, it's willful. They don't want it. We want the parking lot. It's a stubbornness. It's a stubbornness. Well, they're, they're, they just not heard about it. Yes, they have. Two and a half tribes knew there's a land of promise. Get across the river. The parking lot is great, but there's something better in there. Mm -mm. Give me the parking lot. I'm just fine. Oh, this is good. What can I expect from a non-spirit-filled church? Well, lack of Holy Spirit power. Why? Because he's not biblically welcome. And the preachers aren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can't give what you don't have. Amen. Amen. I can honestly say I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit in 1985. Saved in fall of 84. I think I received my baptism in the Spirit in, in the early months of 1985. Through a lot of struggle. Amen. It doesn't always have to be that way, but I feel the enemy was trying to hinder what God was trying to do in my life. But I cross that river. And I've never looked back. I don't want church in the parking lot. I want to be in the promised land. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. There's no baptism in the Spirit. There's a lack of Holy Spirit power because He's not biblically welcome. Preachers are not baptized with the Holy Spirit. Which means then there's little true worship. There's a lot of praise, a lot of noise, a lot of hype. But there's very little, if any, true worship. Because you cannot worship in spirit and truth without the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The Father looks for those that will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Well, if I haven't received... My prayer language, if I haven't received the baptism, does that mean I'm substandard? You, again, you're not substandard at all. But I am trying to get you over the river. Amen. You need to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I don't care. Brother Swagger, Brother Donnie was telling me, you know, telling people, you hear it in his messages, that there were people for 20 and 30 years, for whatever reason, couldn't receive, they couldn't get through, but they wanted to. The big difference is they never gave up. And once they received it, then all of a sudden it dawned on them what the problem was. It was just a subtle unbelief. And once they got through, they realized, I could have received, oh man, all these years? Amen. The message this morning is crossing Jordan. Have you crossed that river? Do you want to cross that river? Because if you want life in the parking lot, all right. But don't hinder us from wanting to go farther into the deep truths and graces of God. Amen. What can I expect from a non-spirit-filled church? You're going to hear about a redefined Jesus who is not currently the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. They have redefined Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, yes or no? It's in your Gospels. It's in your Bible. John the Baptist said of Jesus Christ, there's one coming after me. He's mightier than I. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and loose the latchet of his sandal. 
But this one will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. Hallelujah. When Jesus showed up, came out of the great wilderness after he was tempted, he came out in the power of the Spirit. We saw the Spirit of God upon him, working in him and working through him. When he paid the sin debt of man and he ascended up on high, he told those remaining disciples, don't preach one message, don't start a church, don't do one Bible study. You wait, go to Jerusalem and wait until the Spirit of God comes. And on the day of Pentecost, 50 days later... You read in Acts chapter 2, there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. Hallelujah. You'll never hear that in a non-spirit filled church. There's a sound. There's a sound. There's a sound in the spirit filled realm. There's a sound. Hallelujah. It may not always be a mighty rushing wind, but my God, there's life there. There's passion there. There's power there. The blood is there. Jesus Christ is there. The Holy Spirit is there. Oh, hallelujah. Why are you preaching so loud, pastor? Because I want you to hear. Amen. It's for all of you. It's for every one of you. Hallelujah. You can have the parking lot or you can have the rivers of life. What do you want? What do you want? It's for whosoever will. Amen. We go a little farther. Oh, I, I scribbled this all down about five minutes last night. What can I expect from a non-spirit? I had to ponder it a little bit. They redefine Jesus Christ. I want, to, I want to belabor that just a moment. They redefine Jesus Christ. They say he's no longer the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. No, he don't baptize in the Holy Spirit no more. That, that all passed away. But my Bible still says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I, I can't. Well, it's not true, Pastor. I challenge every one of you that know of a non-spirit-filled friend, individual, family member, or pastor. Ask them about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Ask them, is Jesus Christ the baptizer in the Holy Spirit? Just ask them about it. Ask the preachers about it. And listen to their excuses. They try to worm their way out of even having to answer the question. <laughs> What's the issue? What's the issue? And most of those churches boast how they hold to the Word of God. <laughs> We're built on the Word of God. Okay, let's go to the book, the book of Acts. Um, well, let's go to Matthew. <laughs> let's go to Romans. <laughs> I don't ever want to be in a church where they're redefining who Jesus is. Because they're, they're even breaking the second commandment. They're changing the image of God into the likeness of a man or something else. They're redefining Jesus Christ. How do you like that? Do you want to sit under a preacher who's twisting, re-bending and refashioning to their own image what they say Jesus is? Paul said they're going to preach a different Jesus. Why would Paul bring that up? Paul said they're preaching Jesus. The Judaizers are preaching Jesus. But they're saying you got to keep law. You got to be circumcised. You got to keep the feast days. Paul says they're all wrong. They're heretics. They are not representing Jesus Christ. They're preaching a different Jesus. Well, Pastor, can anybody get saved in the parking lot? Yeah. Yeah. God is that merciful, that graceful. God deals with people. You can get saved in a parking lot, church. Amen. You can. But what then? What then? I have known people who've had family members that have lived their entire, from a child, lived their life in those non-spirit-filled churches, and you know what comes out of it in the long term? A very casual Christianity. No hunger for the things of the Spirit. 
they've become a homeborn slave. They're like that animal who was meant to roam the wild tundra of Africa, but born in a corral. And to them, life is normal, and that's all there is. And when you try to say, come on over to the spirit field, come on over, Jordan, come over, be with us, they just, it's not even a hunger. That's the danger, my friend. That's what I'm trying to warn you about, and you better be careful, the Reb Shekas that are trying to tell you how much better it is in the parking lot. I don't care how full it is. I don't care what they all go in. I don't care, many, I don't care how many Kool-Aid stands they have out there. And how many cookie sales. I don't care if they got Blue Bunny ice cream or something. I mean, give me the Holy Spirit. Give me Jesus Christ. Give me the Word of God. Give me true worship. Give me a good old-fashioned Pentecostal service. It may be crude, it may be rude, it may be bare. We may have empty spaces here, but God is here. Yeah. Hallelujah. They redefine Jesus Christ. Oh, this, it gets better. What can I expect from a non-spirit-filled church? Little, if any, spiritual revelation of the Word of God, because without the Holy Spirit, you can't grow in true spiritual understanding. You can't learn the Bible in an English class in a secular environment. You can learn Bible verses. You can learn simple nuggets of truth. But you'll never come to know the ways of God. You'll never know how He moves in your life. Everything will be mechanical. Everything will just be you and your own strength as you get up and you point the bullet and you try to live a good life. What's wrong with that? You need the Holy Spirit because it still comes short of the glory of God. Life in the parking lot's not easy either. You want to hear something else about life in non-spirit filled environment? They can never learn the ways of God. Because the ways of God only come to the Spirit filled. But those churches are full of a lot of natural reasoning and understanding and human planning and scheming. In other words, full of activity. But there is lack of divine power and victory over sin in the heart and life of those people. Because the power of the cross can only function when you put the battery in it. The battery is the power of the Holy Spirit that you get when you cross over Jordan. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You need the power. You need power. You need power. You need power. Yeah. Hallelujah. I need power. You need power. You need power. Oh, but pastor, I love the parking lot. It's just nice. There's trees, pavement, a lot of people, a lot of activity. In fact, they build nice tents over the parking lot now. They look so nice. We turn our lights dim and we light up the stage. All the musicians are up there in ratty t-shirts and jeans. And we all bebop and we do our thing. Amen. We look like the world, we act like the world, we fashion like the world. Oh, but before we sit down, we'll, we'll have the piano player do a nice version of Amazing Grace or something. And then to satisfy the older crowd, we'll have a little more standard service at a certain time, then we'll have another service for the younger crowd. It is always wrong to segregate and divide the body of Christ. That is a sin. That is wrong. That is wrong. Amen. What are they trying to display? 
They're trying to show God is divided, that God has two different gospels, three different gospels, ten different gospels. That what, that what, yeah, but we, we might not, we don't, we don't like every song you sing. You're not supposed to like every song we sing. It's for everybody. There's a little of something for everybody. But we are one body, not two or three or four or five or ten or fifteen. Amen? We are one body, and there should be one preacher preaching the same message to the same people. Why don't we get victory over sin if we're in a non-spirit-filled church? Because you've got to realize, it's called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He didn't say the law of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit. You must have the Holy Spirit as it regards Jesus, the baptizer, baptizing you in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other languages as the Spirit of God gives you utterance. That's just an evidence that you have been baptized. Amen? It may be a vowel or two. It may be a noise or two, don't try to figure it out. Take it by faith. Get through Jordan. And let's get in to the land of promise where the true life of God is. And folks, watch out for the Rabshakas. They are cunning. They are clean. They are smooth. The devil don't come to you in pitchforks. He comes to you in a nice, well-dressed attire at times. Come on. Come on. That's why you got to discern them. Let me finish this up. I know I'm going longer, but I have a lot to say. You see, God wants you over Jordan that you can enjoy victory over the sin nature that's in all of us. And we can only find that victory as we apply the cross, the benefits of Christ for which He died, by the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit that abides in us. Amen? And we enjoy the Spirit-filled life. But I'm here to say, you who are hurting and broken and wounded and discouraged and disappointed, I got good news. There's honey in the rock for you, my friend. Hallelujah! Glory to God. And I'm here to say it's still not by human might nor by human power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Let's stand. Oh, musicians. I want to encourage you. Get the DVD of this service. Get the CD message of this service. Make copies. Pass them out to people because this is a time of war. This is a time for the body of Christ to stand up. And I am sick and tired as a preacher of the gospel being in a community where Pentecost is demeaned, where it's cast down, where people are always wanting everything that this world can offer. I'm here to say, give me Jesus, give me the Holy Spirit and fire. Give me that for which Christ has died because we're not changing it. And if they want the parking lot, let them do their rain dance. That's all right. I'll love them in the Lord. But you know what? I'm going on with Jesus just the same. And I'm going to have everything for which he died. And I've been asking him, I want a full reward when I pass on. I want everything for which Christ died to give me. I'm here to say some of you have been through hell on earth. Some of you have dealt with the very people I'm mentioning. Some of you have had lunch with Reb Shekha. Come on. And they keep telling you how good the parking lot is. Well, if it's so good, why do they keep pulling you? Why, why they? It's so good, but there's no spirit filled, no baptism of the Holy Spirit, no power of God. They, they change who Jesus is. They redefine him. Amen. All because we got a couple in this church that came out of a church by his own testimony. He said for, la for several years before God called them to move on and come here, they went and tried to get on this bandwagon of all this community stuff. And they did this, and they did that, and they did this, they did everything. I mean, everything from, uh, maybe I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but from carnivals to food drives or whatever it be. That church went from a couple hundred, and they said they're down into the 20s. Amen? Praise everybody else. And you know why that happens? Because leadership 
has left the Holy Spirit. They're trying to make life work in a parking lot when God has called you to get across Jordan. Folks, every one of you need to cross Jordan. And I need to stay across Jordan. And I'm not coming back to live in the parking lot of Christianity. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. This church is not going to the parking lot. This church will stay a spirit-filled church. We will preach Christ and crucify. We will preach the blood. And we may be crude at it. We may... Oh, I'll preach all over again. But you know what? We have something precious. We have something precious. God spoke to my heart four days ago. Taking my time, I throw my Bible on my lap in the morning and I, I go before the Lord. And Sometimes he'll talk to me out of the word, not always. Sometimes I just learn the word to learn the word. But this morning, that morning, is out of Revelation, I believe chapter 3, dealing with the church of Philadelphia. Jesus was speaking and he said to the Philadelphia church, I have set before you an open door. I have set before you an open door. And I'm the one who opens doors no man can shut, and I shut doors no man can open. Had I not had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it would have been very hard for me to have been quickened in that verse. But the Spirit of the Lord brought that to life. And you know what he told me out of that? I'm paraphrasing. And if you read the rest of that, the Lord took me through, basically dealing with the Reb Shekas. It says basically this. He said, those that say... You have dealt with those that say they are Jews and you found them to be liars. But the day's going to come. They're going to come back and they'll worship at your feet. Now, that sounds self-serving and I'm not meaning it to be that way. I don't want nobody worshiping at my feet. <laughs> there's only one you worship at his feet and that's Jesus Christ. But there's a truth there. The bottom line, there are people in the last 16 years of this church ministry that have slandered this pastor his wife, and this work. I love them in the Lord, but I deliver them onto the parking lot of life. And if they want to come back, and God has humbled them, and they now come broken, they are welcome to be part of us again, should they ever desire to do so. If not, there is a people for Promised Land Church. You're the fruit of that. You're the proof of that. Oh, we may drive distances, but a church alive is worth the drive. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God's not done with us yet. God's not done with this church. He's not done with this pastor and his wife. I'll be the first one to admit, I'm still growing in this thing. I'm still learning. I'm still skinning my knees as I learn the ways of God. Amen. But one thing I said in, in that church of Philadelphia, one thing Jesus commanded them, he says, you've never departed from my truth. You've never departed from my truth. You've always held fast my name. I can say all the years I've been in ministry, I have held up Jesus Christ and I've preached him. I have preached him. And that is never by the grace of God.